Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us for today's CNCF webinar, Transac uh, Transactional <clears throat> excuse me, Transactional Microservices with Vitesse Coordination Without Scale. I'm Jerry Fallon and I will be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Daniel Kozlowski, Minister of Engineering at, Plan at Planet Scale. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Please be respectful of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Daniel for today's webinar. Great, thank you so much. As Jerry said, my name is Dan Kozlowski. I am uh, a maintainer of Vitesse, which is a CNCF project. I'm also the Minister of Engineering at a company called PlanetScale. Uh, PlanetScale was founded by one of the creators of Vitesse, and we work on Vitesse, and we run a database as a service based off of it. And one of the things we get asked a lot is as people are looking at their services, either trying to scale or thinking about scale in the future, a lot of times they're talking about moving to microservices. Um, this has been traditionally one of the ways that you would get additional scale out of your application. If you split it up, then you can get more throughput. Um, so people come to us and talk to us all the time. There are lots of problems that we see people face and as database scaling experts, um, we generally have some advice for them about what you can do and how you can use Vitesse to solve those problems. But as we're developing the product, um, Vitesse also brings some uh, extra features uh, to the database realm that are really unique to Vitesse that allow you to do some things that I don't think any other database lets you do. So I uh, wanted to put together a, a demo of how we can use those. Um, this is still not a widely used technology of the test. The pieces have been around for a very long time, um, but we're really exploring uh, what can be done here. And we're kind of pushing uh, how you can use the test with microservices. So some of the things that you're gonna see today are brand new. Um, the code will be made available and please write down as many questions as you have. Uh, I'm not used to this one-sided talking thing. I really like interaction, so would love to answer your questions as we move through the presentation, but I have to wait till the end. Uh, so let's get started. Um, first, what is what do I mean when I say monolith and microservice, right? So a monolith, I generally would define like this. Um, it is a service which may be split into different modules, depending on the size of the service, depending on the size of the team, um, it may be split apart, but generally the defining characteristic is it's built and deployed as a single um, service, as a single binary, a single process. So this may be in Java, it may be in Go, it could be in Ruby, it could be in any language, um, but it's going to be one deployable that goes out. And uh, it doesn't mean it's, it's singular, there may be multiple. So you are obviously following best practices, you have implemented the 12 factor methodology, um, so you don't have any state in this service. You can run as many of these as you want to horizontally scale them. Um, however, state is always pushed outside and traditionally that is to a database, uh, either a relational or a non-relational database. And so your monolithic architecture may look like this. The client comes in, it'll hit the service. All the modules of service would communicate with the database. This is really useful because your um, application probably has some transaction architecture built into it. Um, very common for any service that has complex logic to require transactions. Uh, and so your transaction architecture may look like this. It may go to one module which begins a transaction, gets some data, that uh, connection which contains the transaction information is passed to another module through uh, IPC, and then um, we can do some more selects, maybe an insert, maybe an update. Finally, we will commit the transaction and everything's either gonna happen or it's not gonna happen. We're gonna have nice acid properties and uh, our users are always gonna see consistent state. So this might be our traditional transaction architecture in our traditional monolith architecture. Well, what happens when we move to microservices? 
Um, generally, the best practice when you're moving to microservices is to have an architecture that looks something like this. You may have multiple services. Those services will probably sit behind some sort of coordinator. In this uh, diagram here, I have an API gateway, but there's lots of ways to do it. And um, you're still following that great 12-factor methodology, so you're not storing state in your services. You are pushing the state outside of your service into a database. Um, you'll find a lot of different information about how this should be done because there really isn't a great way to do this. There's trade-offs on either side. Um, I think the general recommendation, if you were to ask 100 people, most of them would say you do database per service. This is what we have seen at PlanetScale as people have come to us we have seen individuals going database per service. So my modules have turned into services. The defining characteristic here is um, I can have shared code, I can have not shared code, but what I have is three separate deployable objects. They're versioned independently, they're deployed independently, I can lifecycle them independently, um, and because of that, they're talking to databases independently. That causes some issues when we're talking about our transaction architecture because in the monolithic architecture we were passing um we were passing our connection through ipc so we could actually maintain the same database connection and we could maintain a transaction between my between the different modules as soon as we move to microservices we lose that capability you can't actually maintain the transaction there are different databases so you have to do something else to have uh, transactions or to have any complex business logic with your microservices. But wait, what if I just use the same database? Um, well, this is not really uh, gonna solve any of your problems. What's going to happen here is your independent services, while they are still microservices, they're still versioned and life cycled independently, they now have a shared, um, external dependency which needs to be managed in unison with all of them. So you have a single point of failure, you have something that is gonna to need to be managed not by one service but three services. So as you're doing management tasks like uh, um, schema updates or if you're doing any performance related um, issues, they're all gonna be shared by all of your services. Also, uh, while you may be able to have all of your data in one spot, um, nothing says that that data is going to remain consistent across multiple versions of your service. It's very common in this scenario for the user service to make a schema change, uh, but since the campaign service is a different module, it may not know about that schema change and all of a sudden its queries start failing. Um, so there's a lot of hidden problems there, and to make matters even worse, you still can't do distributed transactions because the different services can't actually share that connection each different process is going to have a different connection to the database and there's no way for those processes to share that information. So um, what this actually shows us is we've been lying to ourselves this whole time, right? We've said we follow the 12 factor methodology. We said that our services don't have state. It's all pushed out to the database. That was a lie. That was a horrible lie because we had this this implicit state that we don't really think about, and that's the connection. Our connection to the database actually carries a good deal of state with it. In um, the example that I just gave you, that is carrying information about your transaction. Um, that transaction only lives in that connection, and we actually rely on that for certain properties of ACID transactions, right? If I make an insert in that transaction, depending on my isolation level, um, nobody else outside of that transaction is going to see it until I commit it. Um, and also, we're going to have making sure that only one uh, person can update rows. Uh, we're going to make sure that either the entire thing happens or nothing happens. All the properties of ACID, they exist because we have this implicit state. Um, there's also, because of that, another implicit state, and that's the TCP connection to the client. So while, yes, you may horizontally scale your, your services, um, your load balancer probably has a session affinity in it because your clients are going to need to hit the same service or they're not going to be able to do any sort of complex interaction. Well, wow. so what is the solution? Well, enter Vitesse. So Vitesse wasn't built to solve this problem, uh, but it turns out it does and it does it really well. So for those of you who are not familiar with what Vitesse is, uh, this is the architecture of Vitesse. It is a fairly 
Um, it is a distributed database solution. So people will call it a new SQL database. People will call it a sharding system. People will call it many things. But what it does is it takes the traditional database uh, and it splits it up into a couple different parts that we can then um, have behave in interesting ways. So every Vitesse deployment has a few components that it needs. At the very uh, end of a Vitesse deployment, you're gonna have a set of shards. You can have one shard, you can have many shards. A shard is just a uh, portion of your database. Um, the shard is gonna be made up of tablets and each tablet is going to have a MySQL process that actually stores your data. At the end of the day, all data in Vitesse is stored on MySQL. In front of that MySQL process, there is a tender process, which we call VT tablet. That is the process that actually connects to MySQL and actually handles um, the running of queries. Uh, again, we can have as many shards as we like. At any point in time, one of those tablets and one of those MySQL processes is going to be the leader of a shard. And then there can be any number of replicas who are receiving updates via binary logs. The test actually manages that relationship there. It knows how to switch between which tablet is the leader and which tablets are the replicas and make sure that everything stays in sync. On top of that, um, there is uh, a number of stateless gateways. We call these VT gates. Um, you can have as many or a few of them as they like. And this is where the magic in this demonstration is going to happen. Um, VT gate uh, exposes uh, MySQL dialect. So you can connect to it through port 3306 and you can speak the stock MySQL protocol. Most drivers that you'll find for most popular programming languages work directly with this as well as the MySQL command line tools. It behaves generally like you would expect a uh, traditional MySQL database to behave. It takes DDL statements, it takes DML statements, and it modifies your database. Um, there are some other parts of a Vitesse uh, cluster that aren't really important for this demonstration, so we will just ignore those for now. While I'm still on this page, um, it's important to note that this is a distributed database, right? These components are all running on different machines and they could be located in different continents in different data centers. Um, and so to communicate between them, we use gRPC. Uh, so the VT gates actually talk to the VT tablets over gRPC and the VT gates talk to the topology servers and to the control plane, all using this gRPC service layer. Well, uh, it turns out that the VT gate not only talks down to the VT tablets with gRPC, but it also exposes its own uh, gRPC endpoint. So the gRPC endpoint that it exposes has a number of different functions. They are all defined in the protocol buffers in the Vitesse code base. Um, but the two really important ones um, are the execute request and execute response. VTGate has a, an RPC method called execute, which is really what we're gonna be abusing to do all of this. And um, it looks like you would expect this request to look. There is a bound query, which is a query with um, optionally bound parameters. There is a caller ID, which is a, um, it's not the authentication method, but it's actually a second level of identification that you can use to sort of um, further refine who is actually calling uh, a specific query. And then there's that session object. Well, it turns out that um, because of gRPC, what the Vitesse authors did is they took all of the information that is normally implicitly shared in the database connection and they turned it into a session. And so the session object is exchanged like a cookie. Um, and when the the Vitesse authors wrote this down, they, they probably didn't mean actually like a cookie, but when I read it, that's exactly how you can use it. So we have this uh, message, this uh, part of the RPC transaction that actually maintains all of the state. And what originally what this allows you to do is this makes the VT gate actually stateless. If you are using the gRPC endpoint and if you are maintaining the session, your VT gates contain absolutely no state you can actually multiplex between them and you won't notice any difference. So if today you are using the Vitesse drivers that are written in Golang or the JDBC drivers that use the gRPC endpoint, either one of those, uh, you can use this gRPC end, 
uh, gRPC endpoint from your programming language and your VT gates will become completely stateless. Well, um, when you do that, what actually happens is this session is stored on the caller um, and then it's reused to the application. It just looks like a single database connection. Um, it's just that all of the state has been fully pushed out into the client. But there's nothing that says it has to be used that way. So while that is the way the JRPC and uh, um, Golang drivers work, we're, this is a normal gRPC interface. We can do anything we'd like with it. So what if we were to just pull that even a little farther out and move it outside of the service and push it down to the client? And so that's what I'm gonna show. Um, I have a theoretical microservice architecture. It looks like this. Uh, same thing, except instead of having a database per service, we just have a single Vitesse database. Uh, I know what you're saying. I just said this was a bad idea. It turns out that uh, it's not just this gRPC magic that allows Vitesse to operate like this. There's also a number of other features about Vitesse that make this a really good solution. Um, the ones that I want to just touch on right now is that this allows you to scale because Vitesse has a built-in uh, sharding and scaling solution. So you get scale without complexity. It also has built-in management features. So we can do things like online schema changes. We can do things like transaction killers and query watchers which um, help eliminate bad actors from bringing down your database. All right, so what does this look like? Um, I'm gonna walk you through an example here using JavaScript um, that is going to use the gRPC endpoint and is gonna display some of these properties. So I'm gonna switch to my text editor. And um, what I've done here is I have written a, a pretty quick TypeScript library here just to show how you could pull uh, the gRPC endpoint into your programming language, and you could use it to run queries like you would on any database, but then also how you can use it to explicitly pass state. So walking you through this code here, what we see is I have a client class that's got two very important functions. One is just a, a connection class, which gives you a standard database connection, but then another one which says, I would like you to make a connection, but I'm gonna give you the session information. Um, the way I have them wired up is if you just ask for a stock uh, connection, then ben, you uh, excuse. Did you intend to show an editor? There's yes, a comment is, that. Yep, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so this is going to give you a, uh, a connection that already has the session preloaded. Uh, the rest of this is... Um, fairly mundane, just wiring to wire up the ability to run queries and to wire up the ability to parse queries into result sets. So again, this code will be made available online. It is um, not necessarily boilerplate, but it is uh, fairly straightforward uh, wiring code to make all this work. It all starts out with a connection to our service. So here is the lines of code that actually create a connection to our service. And this just establishes the gRPC connection to our service. At that point, sending queries is a matter of creating the correct objects and passing them through. Right. So what does this look like in practice? So in practice, um, we can have a number of services which look like they're using a standard database. So in this case, I'm running a query. Um, because I have a single unified uh, database, I can actually Dan, have... can I can I interrupt? Yes. We, uh, everyone is still seeing only the slides. And not anything else. I'm sorry about that. Let's try it again. Yeah, that's better. Awesome. All right. Uh, well... This was my lovely, lovely text editor. Um, the connection code is located here. Again, it's, it's split into a standard connection and then a connection with a session. Uh, and again, stock gRPC code. Um, all the, the uh, code was generated with the gRPC code generator. And then we've just wired it up here. Again, code will be online. You will be able to see it. Let me go back to my server. Great thing here is this is a standard MySQL database. So this is a stock SQL. 
Um, and I'm even doing a join here to pull in some information uh, across services. Great thing here is I can do it this way where I'm actually joining in other tables or if I wanna keep strong separation between these services, I can actually, I can do that now because I have explicit state management. So what I'm going to do is um, in each of my services, whenever a request is made, I'm going to check the headers to see if somebody passed into the test session. If they did, I'm gonna continue on with that session. If they didn't, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new session. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm going to do is when I am done, I'm actually going to pass my session out to uh, the next caller. So when a request comes in, I'm actually going to check that it's got a, uh, whether or not it has a session if it doesn't, I'm going to um, create a new one. And then when I'm done with it, I'm gonna pass the session back out. All right. Well, what does this look like in practice? I have a, uh, a sample JavaScript app here that I'm gonna run from the command line. So uh, you can do this one of two ways. You could either do it with complete user control. This could be pushed all the way out to your user's browser. And that's kind of how I have it set up or you can do it in a microservice. That microservice can just pass the transaction information to other services as it does coordination locally. So um, for the effect of this demo, I've created a transaction microservice, which will do my begins and commits. So I'm first going to ask for a transaction to begin, and then I'm going to insert some data, and then I'm going to commit that transaction. And again, this is gonna happen in two separate microservices. So I will just go ahead and copy this script and you should all be seeing my terminal now. DP, are you seeing my terminal now? Yes. Beautiful. All right. So I'm going to paste this script. It's going to do um, some stuff, but before that, I'm going to go ahead to a MySQL prompt. This is standard MySQL. This is not um, anything special to the test, although you can see that when I connected, I connected to a test server. Uh, so I can say show tables, hopefully didn't drop my session, nope. And I can select star from campaign. And I don't have anything in there. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna paste this and um, all that text that just scrolled past your screens is me actually running uh, the, the transaction. So I have um, created a transaction, I have inserted some data, and now I'm actually waiting at the commit stage. And what's really cool here is if I do that same select, it's empty because even though I have inserted the data, I haven't committed yet, so it's not crossing the boundaries of that connection. If I go ahead and commit the data, all right, my commit has happened, I've gotten back a 200 okay. Now my data has made it in, um, my transaction has been committed and we can go along. And this would work for, again, I've pulled this all the way out to the user, but this would work inside the service as well. Uh, so you can have any number of services. We can pass around our sessions. State has now become explicit. By passing this all the way to the user, I don't even have to worry about session affinity to my services. Um, I can upgrade my services without dropping transactions, without dropping any user requests. Um, so I have pushed even more of my maintenance burden off into the test. And then again, uh, the code to use this looks exactly like database code. In fact, um, it's compatible with a lot of your ORMs and your other tooling that you use for your uh, database today with the extra features that you can pull in things like this GRBC endpoint to be able to do even more things that you can't do with other database systems. Okay, back to slides. I'm gonna stop the screen share and then start again because that seems to give me the best result. Cool. So that is what a Vitesse microservice arch architecture looks like. Um, but I hear you say, my application is a monolith. We're only moving to microservices. Uh, so this is actually really good fit. This is a, a great fit for Vitesse because Vitesse 
uh, looks like a traditional database. So if you are running on MySQL today, you can actually deploy the test in front of it and have all the access to your database. And then as you move to microservices, you can implement things like the strangler pattern to actually pull out transactions and pull out complex logic from your monolith into these microservices. So you don't have to worry about doing it an all or nothing or doing a database migration. Um, with the tests, you can actually move your monolith into microservices easier than if you were to adopt um, a different style database. But if you use the same database, you won't have independent services. Like I had said before, the test actually takes all of the problems that you would have by using uh, the same database and it removes all of them. It has built in sharding to allow you to scale. It has built in management like online schema change to allow you to do maintenance actions without impacting other services. And then it's got, on, it's got protections built in like query timeouts and query throttling that will allow you to use a single database service but make sure that all the independent services can't negatively affect each other. Um, and it also, aside from all that, by having um, the test, you also get additional visibility into your database. So how I said that I had that caller ID, well, now I can actually see which, um, which service or which process is running those queries that are slowing down the database or that are causing my, uh, are causing my response time to balloon. It supports tracing. So your tracing can go from your microservices all the way down through your database and back up. Um, and it actually will give you a better performing solution than if you did move to that database per service model. Um, but you could do the same thing with uh, CQRS or something like the SAGA pattern. This is entirely true. Um, and actually what you're seeing here is the same kind of functionality you would get with CQRS or Saga, you're getting for free with the tests. So you can have a two-phase commit, you can have a multi-shard best effort commit, you can have rollbacks, you can have acid transactions, but you don't actually have to take on the complexity of building out something like CQRS or Saga yourself, you're getting it for free because you're using a database that supports all these things natively. Um, so, that's a little bit about running microservices um, with Vitesse. Again, this is not, uh, this is something that we hear a lot of. It is not necessarily something that a lot of people are doing today, but this is functionality that has been built into Vitesse and has been used for a long time. Like I said, the, the Golang and JDBC drivers both use this same interface and they use these same mechanisms. It's just, we're taking it a step farther here um, the code for this will be posted online. There's, there's obviously lots we could do with it. This was a simple demo to sort of just show a little bit of the techniques involved. Um, so with that, I would love to open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a wonderful presentation. Our first question, this is my first encounter with the test. I'm still a bit unclear what current problem with my SQL the test is trying to solve. If I have a set of microservices talking to my SQL endpoint, are there any concerns there if the SQL client info is stored in the microservice? Are there any problems with data integrity in this case? Yes, so th there are. And that's, um, that's kind of the, the point of this uh, slide. If you are serving um, if you're, you're having a bunch of microservices that are connecting to an external just stock MySQL database, you can't do this, right? You can't actually have transactions that would cross service boundaries. So if, um, if you're doing the, you know, one of the stock examples for a microservice has always been the online store, right? Where a user wants to buy something. And so you may have a user service and an inventory service, and then you may have something like a credit service that's determining if this transaction can go through. Uh, if you had a single database, those three would be modules, and that whole interaction would happen in a transaction. So either the user's order is going to go through, we're going to check that they have credit, and we're gonna check that they have inventory, and then we're gonna return back that yes, the order completed, and the, user, the user's order has happened, or uh, something occurred, either the uh, credit was insufficient or we didn't have inventory. So we're actually going to roll back that transaction 
and that order isn't going to happen. You can't do that as soon as you move to microservices. Even if you have the same database, um, you can't do that transaction across connections. As soon as you switch connections, the transaction is, uh, is gonna be invisible to the other connections. To get around that, that's why people would say, well, you use CQRS or you use something like Saga with an external coordinator um, to make sure that you can have that transaction happen across those boundaries. What I'm saying is with Vitesse, you actually, you can do that. You can have microservices where your transaction can cross microservice boundaries and you'll get the same kind of acid transaction that you would expect off of a single connection across your microservice mesh that you're using. Awesome. Would you have been able, would you be able to elaborate a bit more on the comparison between ex, the explicit session with the test and the traditional implicit handling? Yes. So um, it, the explicit session with the test is uh, a bit of a complex object. What it actually does is when the test services your query, the query will come in through the VT gate. VT gate has a full SQL parser in it and it knows how to route your queries to either a single or multiple shards. When your client sends that, if you're using the MySQL port, um, the connection is maintained inside a VT gate that any packets coming across this, um, any packets for this connection ID are going to go back to this client. But then as soon as it goes down to the VT tablets, it actually switches to gRPC internally which multiplexes all client connections across a single gRPC tunnel between the VT gate and the VT tablet. To keep everything in line, the VT tablet actually establishes a uh, connection ID. Um, for every single client connection that's inbound, the VT tablet establishes a connection ID, and it uses that to pass information down to the backing MySQL, and then return that back to the VT gate. Because that's all multiplexed, it needs to pass along some information to the VT gate so the VT gate knows which MySQL connection to uh, return the information to. What the gRPC endpoint does is it takes that same bit of information that the VT tablet sends to the VT gate and allows you to just continue sending that out to the client so that um, when the VT gate gets a query over the gRPC interface, instead of associating the, uh, instead of associating that stream with a particular uh, client, it actually just looks at the session and says, okay, um, I already have the session information, so I don't really need to know uh, which MySQL socket to send this out on. I'm just gonna pass this down to my VT tablet and when it comes back, I'm gonna send it back up to the client. I know that's not the world's best explanation, it's a lot better if you have a whiteboard or some code in front of you so you can see how this is all being wired together. Um, but that is how it actually works. Okay. So I have plenty of time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. So please feel free to drop in your questions into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. Can you tell us how this compares to the database cockroach DB? Yeah, I mean, so Vitesse and cockroach are similar in some ways that they are both uh, distributed in nature. So they give you things like high availability and scale. Um, Vitesse is a little bit different. We always say that Vitesse is the world's only cloud native database because Vitesse is fo focused more on uh, transactionality and focused more on um, being able to get those aspects of a cloud native system, um, uh, horizontal scalability, uh, ease of management, treating your, uh, treating your resources like they are uh, row crops and not gardens. Um, whereas Cockroach is a little bit more of a holistic system. So you'll see that in 
uh, and setting it up. Cockroach is generally a little bit easier to get online, um, but something like the test is generally going to um, perform a little bit better when you have lots of transactional data and you have a very dynamic runtime environment. Works really well in things like Kubernetes because it's kind of built for the idea that at any point in time, any single part of a test can go away um, and your queries are still going to be serviced. And that's it's kind of what has led to this kind of functionality um, because it is built with failure in mind, right? It's built to know that at any point in time, a single component could go down. We have really tried hard to push state out and to um, reduce single points of failure so that uh, almost any part of your database cluster can go down and your transactions are still going to be serviced, your queries are still going to be serviced. Um, so when you think about it, it's built for sort of the five nines uptime of very fast transactions. Uh, and that's, you know, that lends itself to be a little bit more complex, but it also gives you a little bit more flexibility. Okay, and there's, now there's an, another question here. I believe this is in relation to the one you answered before the last one. Is there a performance penalty like a database lock using transactions? Uh, no, well, there, there is locks get established um, like they would in uh, a standard MySQL database. So if I did uh, an insert on a row and then I tried to delete all of the data in that table, um, the delete wouldn't happen until the transaction lock cleared either by committing the transaction or allowing the transaction timeout to occur. Um, but it's, uh, it is not actually imposed by the test. It's imposed at the MySQL layer. So it's the standard, the standard locking that you would get in an InnoDB database. Um, there's many different kinds of locking, but there's no additional locking that happens because of the test. There is a bit of a performance penalty in that gRPC is less performant than the MySQL connection. So if you were going, um, even just the test against the test, if you were benchmarking the Vitesse MySQL server endpoint versus the Vitesse gRPC endpoint, the Vitesse MySQL server endpoint is going to have higher throughput than the gRPC endpoint because um, that gRPC interaction does take a little bit more CPU than the stock MySQL server. How does Vitesse manage schema updates when multiple microservices are using different versions of this schema? Yeah, so um, there's a couple different ways you can do this. Uh, at the end of the day, schema updates are very much up to the user. So if you wanna completely decouple your schema of your microservices, this gives you a path to do it. You can have completely decoupled schemas uh, and interactions between those can happen just at the microservice layer. So in my example, I actually used a join to resolve a profile ID to a profile name. Uh, if I wanted to keep my schema completely independent, instead of doing that join, when I got the data back for um, the profile ID, I would just make a call off to the profile service and I would get the profile for that ID via the service API. Um, and then that would, uh, I, I would uh, merge those in the microservice and then return that to the user fully merged by me. However, Vitesse gives you some additional features that mean you don't have to do that. And you can start to really use the power of joins and use all of the SQL uh, things that you would like because we can do some things to decouple your services a little bit better. Um, we can't make up for you know, a user uh, creating a schema change that isn't updated in code and so your code queries break. But what we can do is we can make those schema changes completely transparent. One of the problems that we see with microservices is even if you have robust testing to make sure that schema changes don't break independent services, what'll happen is as every single independent service releases, you will start a schema change. Schema changes are generally lock the world kind of operations. So if I have a very large table on the order of one to two terabytes and I have to add a column or drop a column, that can take hours or days where I cannot update that table. So even if you had really good testing and you know that nobody is going to change a schema to break your other services, the fact that you now have 10 different services trying to make changes to the schema means that you're going to incur outages. 
what Vitesse gives you with it is things like online schema change. So um, we have been working on and releasing online schema change functionality built into Vitesse. Historically, we've used external tools to do this, but now it is built into Vitesse. So as you make schema changes, they happen online. Um, you can roll forwards and backwards between schema changes, I believe. DeepD can correct me if that is not built in yet. I believe you can move forwards and backwards in schema changes. Um, so you can actually make your changes uh, with your services and then be completely transparent to your downstream services. So that frees you up to version and lifecycle all of your services independently. You do have to make sure that your schema is compatible. Um, but once you've done that, you now can get past that burden of having multiple maintenance windows and sort of multiplying your maintenance windows for every microservice you bring online. Okay. Can you elaborate a bit more about what happened? Can you elaborate a bit more about the online schema changes? My main doubt is what happens when I try to write the column. Currently, the only solution I see with native MySQL is to duplicate it. Uh, so the, I, the online schema change, historically we've done online schema change with external tools like PTOST or Ghost. Um, the same functionality that Ghost brought to the cable, the GitHub online schema change tool, I don't know what the T is for, um, we, is now built into Vitesse. And what it does is it utilizes vReplication, which is a Vitesse technology we've been working on for about two years now, um, which actually allows you to modify your tables and columns uh, live using vReplication to ensure that the modified columns are in sync with the existing columns or the existing tables, and then do a graceful transfer uh, to the updated schema when you're ready. Um, it's in Vitesse. Uh, if you have a recent version of Vitesse, I believe you're gonna have to have version 8.0. It actually is just an annotation on the uh, DDL statement, which allows you to trigger an online schema change. Um, and I believe if you join us on the Vitesse Slack channel, which is on the screen now, vitesse.io forward slash Slack, um, we can explain to you in detail how that whole process works and how to get started. Um, again, we've been doing it with outside tools, but we recently, as a version 8.0, have pulled this natively into Vitesse. Excellent. We still have plenty of time for questions, folks, so please feel free to drop any other questions into the Q&A box. We have about 13 minutes left in the webinar, so please feel free to ask away. Just to add a little bit to what Dan said about the online schema changes, um, that work is still experimental and we expect to merge it in the next few days and it will be available in the 8.0 release that's coming up in a few weeks. Anyone at all? Does Vitesse just support MySQL or other backends available? It does not support other backends. So it, it is very MySQL centric. Um, the query parser is the MySQL dialect of the query parser, and it is stored in a MySQL database. That being said, depending on your exact needs, we actually do have multiple engines for MySQL that are supported. So we know that there's obviously people out there using inodb. 
uh, the default engine, but we also have uh, quite a few users who are using my rocks. Uh, so if you wanted that uh, log structured merge tree style storage engine, um, my rocks would allow you to get that. So we don't support other storage systems, but we do support uh, a number of database backends. Um, the pluggable storage engine that MySQL supports, a lot of those will still work with Vitess. We also support um, many MySQL variants, including MariaDB, Percona, and uh, Oracle's MySQL Enterprise version. And uh, po support for Postgres is something that has come up uh, many times, and that is in the long-term roadmap. We are looking for contributors who might want to um, work with us on that. Is the session object in header a big overhead? No, not really. Yeah, it's, um, I, I have base 64 encoded the header. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen and then try to share my screen again. I can show you exactly what it looks like base 64 encoded. So again, here was that, uh, that session that I had ran. Um, at, its, at its biggest, here is what the session looks like. So um, it's not terribly large. Uh, it can, if you have a highly, this, this uh, actually grows with the number of shards. So if you were doing a very complex multi-shard transaction, it can get a little bit bigger than this. Um, but it, again, this is the serialization of a protobuf object. It is very compact. Okay. So I'll have about eight minutes left for questions. So please feel free to ask away. We have anyone else at all? Anyone at all? Are there any projects using Fitess for Saga? It seems a little bit, it seems a little technology to lock in. What are your ideas about this? Um, well, great thing about Vitesse, there, it, is, uh, it is used by a large number of uh, companies. Um, but you wouldn't need to use it with, with Saga. The, you can actually get the same functionality in uh, native Vitesse. So most people who adopt it um, aren't gonna be implementing CQRS or another pattern on top of it. They're just going to use um, Vitesse. In terms of lock-in, um, Vitesse is pretty interesting because it is in fact a, a standard MySQL database. So uh, you can at any point in time, stop using Vitesse and go back to using MySQL. There does, however, come a point where realistically you're locked in. So there are people running Vitesse who are doing 35 million queries per second across thousands of shards. 
um, that span tens of thousands of database servers. At that point, you, you really need, like, you know, you, you can't take your hundreds of terabytes of data and put that into pretty much any other database system and get the same um, level of performance. So um, functionally, there is no lock-in. You can go back to using stock MySQL at any point in time, but um, there's gonna be some things that once you start using Vitesse, uh, getting into other systems, there's just not too many alternatives out there right now. Uh, so it, it really, if you're using this simply for the management and um, some of the extra features, and your database, your data could be serviced by a, a different MySQL server, then there's no lock-in. You can actually just turn Vitesse off and you'll have your MySQL server in the background you connect directly to it. Um, your queries will stay the same. Your code will generally stay the same. You would just have to remove the Vitesse specific functionality like you know, the gRPC connection, um, the sessions, you need all those. Awesome. Is there an interface exposed to implement other backends? Say you were to implement these 20 methods and some guidance around it, then it should work around other backends non MySQL 2. So there, yes, there is. Uh, the, the, um, there are interfaces where if you were to implement that interface for a backend, it would work with that backend. Um, so uh, DP, you would know better than me, but I think if you were to implement the query server, uh, you could pretty much put whatever you wanted behind that query server and right. it would, yeah. But Yeah, but uh, it would be a significant, rewriting a significant portion of the code. So uh, there is the um, interaction with the backend database for management functions, which is one part of it, but there's also the parsing and the uh, parser right now is a MySQL compatible parser. So we would need to uh, build a way of plugging in a different parser depending on the uh, backend flavor. So uh, the bottom line is that that work of extracting and formalizing the interfaces required to plug in a different database is still to be done. And that the, the parser, the parser planner construct, which actually does most of the work, because we have a MySQL database as the back end, the planner in Vitesse is going to look a little bit different than the planner in some other databases. We don't translate down to like a block fetch or to a key fetch um, the way some other distributed databases do, where uh, queries are parsed and then they're planned down to a key fetch and then they're sent to the back end just for a key fetch. We actually, because we have a full database in the background, we will actually um, parse the query and then the, the result of the planning of the query is actually another query. And um, that's part of the reason why we can be as fast as we are and as scalable as we are because we can push almost all of the work down to the backing databases. But then it also means that, as Deepthi said, not only do you have to implement the, the query server, which actually returns the data, but the parser and planner is very much tuned for the MySQL dialect of SQL. Okay. Uh, time for about one more question, I believe. So if anyone has a last minute question they'd like to shoot Daniel's way, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A box. Would you be able to elaborate a bit more on planner? On the planner? Um, yes, uh, I'm, I am definitely not the expert in the planner. If you want um, the nitty gritty details, you wanna go to the test.io forward slash Slack and join our Slack channel. And uh, we can hook you up with the people who spend most of their time working on the planner. Um, but what we do is we actually do a full parse of the SQL query. Uh, so we have a custom written SQL parser, which uh, creates an AST. And then that AST, instead of, again, instead of going down to a block fetch, um, the planner translates it, it, the planner uses the V schema um, along with the uh, shard information that is live updated from the lock server. 
which is one of those components that we sort of breezed over in the architecture diagram, um, to actually create a routing and execution plan. Uh, the routing and execution plan is based off of the currently serving live shards. And um, the actual result of that, like I said, is a SQL query. So much like you have query builders in a lot of ORMs, um, we have almost the same thing inside of a test. We can take that AST, we can um, rewrite it, and then uh, serialize it back to a query and pass it down to MySQL. Um, the exact steps of that are, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, as, it's as complex as any of your uh, planners would be, um, which again, I'm not the expert in the actual details uh, for that. Hit up the Slack channel um, and we can get you uh, online with somebody who does know more than me. All right, well, thank you very much, Daniel, for uh, all of your time today. And thank you to everybody who took time out of their day for attending today's webinar. As I said before, today's presentation will be available later on on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io slash webinars, along with the slides that were used today. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Please take care, stay safe, have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you all next time.